All right, uh, we are continuing uh, in our series on stewardship. And uh, this week, we have uh, come to deal with uh, the dreaded M word, uh, money. So we thank God that you know, he gives us uh, the whole counsel of God in the word. And so even uh, money deals with uh, stewardship. Now, I was going to say that this uh, message that I'm going to share this morning, uh, I'm going to say a lot. And there may be some things in here that uh, you hear for the first time. Uh, there may be some things in here that you don't necessarily agree with. Uh, but uh, I will say this, that, it, that what I'll do is if you email me uh, your question or your concern that, that might arise out of this message, uh, I will, now I'm going to continue the series next week. Next week we're going to be dealing with spiritual gifts. Uh, but I will uh, address any uh, emails that I get, you know, from the pulpit. I won't mention your name, all right, uh, unless you want me to. Uh, but I will if, if, if there's something, because I just want to say uh, that this is a broad subject, and I know there's no way in the world uh, I can do it complete justice in one Sunday. You know, probably I could do a whole series on uh, money, but then uh, probably uh, like this morning, attendance is down. I'm, I'm hoping that the attendance is down because of the weather. Uh, that's, that's what I'm hoping. Not because uh, somebody saw that this was the third T. All right. Uh, but uh, so you know, we, we're going to blame it on the weather this morning. Amen. And some of y'all might have came not knowing what I was going to preach. And you wish you would have stayed home. <laughs> but uh, but we're going we're gonna to try to do this to the glory of God. Let's, let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And uh, Lord, we know that uh, this is a very, very sensitive subject with uh, many people. Uh, so Lord, I pray that uh, as we handle it today, Father, as uh, Jeff uh, said in uh, the introduction, that uh, the hermeneutical principles might be extracted and applied in a way that uh, you would be pleased. And so Lord, we invite the congregation as we come today to come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine, come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, from your table, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, we've been dealing with stewardship, and we said that a steward is one who has been entrusted with the possessions of another. And God has given us all time, talent, and treasure that he has entrusted us with these things. And he wants us to be stewards over the things that he has given us. Now we come to this third topic in the three T's. And that is treasure. And as we begin, I wanted to lay some groundwork before we actually get into the scriptures and get into uh, the message today. And the first thing that I want to say is that uh, there are three money mindsets. Three money mindsets. You know, there's the worldly mindset that says, all that I have belongs to me. And I can do whatever I want to do with it. That's the worldly mindset. And then we move to the church mindset. And the church mindset, or what preachers preach, is that God gets 10% and I get 90%. So that's the church mindset. But when you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you realize that you are in the kingdom of God, that you have a kingdom mindset. And what is the kingdom mindset? The kingdom mindset is that it all belongs to God. Oh, that was kind of weak there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. That, that it all belongs to God, 
And I am a steward. I am a manager of what God has given to me. You know, I heard about a man who had a heart attack. And he was rushed to the hospital. Uh, and he could receive very little company so that he would not get excited. And so while he was in the hospital, a rich uncle died and left him a million dollars. But they didn't know how to break the news to him because they thought that if they told him and he got excited that you know, it would affect his health. So they asked the preacher if he would go and share the news with the uh, man in the hospital. So the preacher went in and he kind of gradually led up to the conversation, did some warm up conversation. And then the, the preacher said, if uh, uh, you had a million dollars, uh, what do you think that you would do with it? And the man said, I would give half of it to the church. And the preacher had a heart attack. <laughs> All right. Money mindsets, money mindset. Now, one of the things that I've been uh, preaching for the longest time, and, and that is, if God has your heart, he has your pocketbook. So, you know, that's why, you know, I, I, and I know I've, I've received a lot of criticism for this. Uh, you know, and, and the thing is, I'm going to tell you what, before I got saved, you know, I, I, I probably had a dim view of preachers like a lot of brothers do that are not in the church. And one of the things that they, they think, now I'm just going to be honest with you. Can we talk, can we talk this morning? <laughs> that, that there's some brothers, uh, they think that preachers are pimps, right? Now, come on, I'm being real. I'm being real. They think that preachers are pimps. And uh, I'm not giving my money, you know, to that church, you know, to that preacher, you know. And, and, and so, you know, that, I, I guess coming out of that background for me, you know, that, that has, and, and maybe that's something I need to pray over and get through because, you know, a lot of preachers unashamedly, you know, uh, uh, twist people's arms and beat them up. Uh, and I guess a little bit in my spirit, you know, goes back to just that kind of thing that I was dealing with, you know, in my past. And then uh, a lot of times when I hear uh, brothers talking about it now, because I, I you know, I, I get it. You know, people still tell me that. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I like to do on Mondays uh, when I'm off is, uh, you know, go work out, and then I'll sit in the sauna. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of interesting conversations that go on in that sauna. I'm going to tell you what. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's been a couple times when that very conversation has arisen, and, and I've heard that, and, and it kind of takes me back, you know, to that, to that mindset. And, and, and so... You know, I, I, I don't try to beat people up and, and try to twist people's arms uh, to give because the bottom line, if God got your heart, he got your pocketbook. You know, I mean, that's, that's, for me, that's, that's it. And, you know, Paul uh, made the following comment about some who had given liberally to the ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. He says this. They first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He said that when they gave, that it wasn't a matter of, you know, coercion. It wasn't a matter of the beat down. But he said that these individuals had their heart sensitized to the Lord. And they first gave themselves to the Lord and then they gave to us. And if you've given yourself to the Lord, at that point, you know, your heart, your mind, your pocketbook is all yielded to him. And then I like what Augustine said, uh, where your pleasure is, there is your treasure. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. Where your heart is, there is your happiness. So it's all, all connected. And so the bottom line is that if, if God has your heart, then he has your pocketbook. So, I, you know, I, personally, you know, I don't uh, argue with God about giving. You know, I don't try to uh, 
finagle or work my way out of giving, you know, I, I realize that, that God has my heart. And, you know, there's something that I'm going to say now. I'm probably going to say a little later on in the message, too. But when you think about uh, this great salvation that we have, when you think about the fact that uh, I was lost and undone without God or his son. And, man, I'm going to argue with God about whether I'm going to give to him or not. So, you know, I, you know to me, I, I, you know, I settled that, you know, a long time ago. Uh, Jesus and money. Jesus and money. Uh, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, uh, one, one out of every six verses deals with money. One out of every six verses deals with money. Of the 29 parables that Christ told, 16 dealt with a person and his money. Why is that? Because Jesus, like when he talked to the rich young, rich young ruler, what did he realize? He realized it's not in what you say, but it's where your heart is at. And, 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 and so the man had a struggle internally. And so I believe that's why Jesus placed so much emphasis on money, because he knew that it was a direct reflection of a person's heart. And then when you think about this, Jesus said more about money than he did about heaven, hell, or even prayer. He said more about money than he said about heaven, hell, or prayer. I tried to pull up some uh, famous people and, and their giving. Uh, J.L. Kraft, the head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation, who had given approximately 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes for many years said the only investment I ever made which paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I had given to the Lord. J.D. Rockefeller, he said, I, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 a week. J.C. Penney, at the end of his life, it was said that he was giving away to Christian causes 90% of his money and lived on 10%. Now, if you were J.C. Penney, I'm sure that 10% was a whole lot to live on. So, I, I mean, I, I would have liked to have lived on his 10%. All right. And then S. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, said, my wife and I were brought up to believe that the more you give, the more you have. So these are people that have been successful, who love the Lord, and how they have viewed uh, giving. Now, let me give you a sad statistic. A sad statistic, and that is this, that the average church member contributes between 1.5% and 2.5% of his total income specifically to the Lord's work. So uh, we know that that's not here at Bethany, uh, because Bethany is a giving church. Yeah. Uh, amen. Amen. That's, you know, y'all give. Y'all give. And, uh, you know, we uh, realize that uh, our stewardship campaign, uh, we've had a couple of big gifts, a couple of significant gifts, but most of the giving of that 1.3 that had, we had, $1.3 million that we have committed, most of that has come from the Bethany family, the Bethany members. So, uh, you know, we thank God. That, uh, that Bethany is a giving church. We might be small in comparison to some of these mega churches, but you know, God has uh, blessed the members to be faithful uh, in their giving. So you know what, with that said, I don't even need to preach anymore. Let's just say amen and go home. <laughs> or oh, somebody was saying, I got an amen too, right? <laughs> somebody said, all right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, be before we get into the scripture this morning, let's look at the uh, mindset. What is the mindset? We, you know, again, we're dealing with stewardship. You know, what is the mindset of a faithful steward? Well, uh, first of all, uh, a faithful steward realizes that I'm a manager and not an owner. And, and, and see, if, if we can 
grasp that biblical truth, uh, that would put us way down the road as far as everything that we have as a Christian. So not only uh, the money, but you know, even you know, our time, our talent, that I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a manager. You know, what, what I have belongs to God. You know, God uh, said in uh, Psalm 24, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they who dwell therein. And, and, and so this, this is the kingdom mindset. You know, the world don't think like this. And when we as believers begin to think like the world, and you know it's easy to think like the world because the world, again, says that it's all mine and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. But when I'm a child of God and I realize that I've been purchased by his blood, I've been bought with a price, I belong to God, then I realize everything that I own belongs to him. And I'm just a manager and not an owner. The second thing is that I have to manage what I have responsibly. That, that God wants you to <clears throat> be wise stewards of what he has given you. So, you know, even if you realize that uh, some people say, well, uh, you know, I believe that I should tithe and give 10%, but the 90% belongs to me. And so that they have the idea, well, you can do whatever you want to do, you know, with that 90%. But you still, even with that 90, if that's the philosophy that you take, even with that 90, you still have to be a wise money manager. You have to be, uh, exercise wisdom in how you use the resources that God has given to you. Uh, where I spend my money is a reflection of where my heart is. All right, I've, I've said here from this pulpit on many occasions, let me see two things about you and I can tell you where your priorities are. Your date book and your checkbook. Because your date book will tell, you, tell me where you're spending most of your time and your checkbook will tell me where you're spending most of your money. So where I spend my money is a reflection of where my heart is at. Oh, here goes one right here. Oh my goodness. I, if we could, you know, some people, not, not many people in here, but some people really need to grasp this one right here. And that is money is my servant and not my master. That money serves me. But you know, when, when I get to the point where you know, I gotta cheat and steal and rob and be greedy and hoard and do all that, I become a slave to money. And you need to ask yourself a question. Are, are you a slave to money? Does money drive you? Does money stand over you with a whip and drive you? Or is money your servant? Money serves me. See what I'm saying? You know, it serves me to be able to pay my bills. It serves me to be able to uh, take a vacation. It, it, it serves me to be able to give to the uh, charities and give to the organizations that I want to give. Money is a servant. And, and as I heard somebody say, uh, money... You might want to write this down. I should have put this up on the screen. And, and, and that is uh, money is a cruel master, but it's a wonderful servant. It's a cruel master, but it's a wonderful servant. If I'm not faithful with the money that I have, God will not entrust me with more. That if you've been faithful in a few things, God said that he'll make you ruler over many. And then... As we talked about the very first Sunday, that you're going to have to give an account of your stewardship. That how you spend your money, you're going to have to give an account of it. So, four things this morning I want to share with you, and they're in your notes. Four things. They all begin with P. The first thing is the priority of my giving. The priority of my giving. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruit of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out, burst out with 
new wine. Notice what he says here. Honor the Lord with thy substance and the first fruits of all thy increase. I've been doing a series on Wednesdays on the feast of the Lord. And last Wednesday we looked at the feast of first fruits. The feast of first fruits was very interesting because the Lord told the Israelites when they came out of Egypt and when they came into the land that they were to offer him the first fruits of their crops. So in the spring, after the winter, the first crop to begin to come up was the barley crop. And before all of the barley crop came up, the farmer would go and he would find some barley, just like that. He would, he would look for the first that was coming up and the best. That's what he would look for, the first and the best. And then he would gather it together he would wrap a ribbon around it and he would cut it. And he would take it to the temple, just like the, there you go right there. That's a barley sheaf. You remember that old song we used to sing? Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Well, that's what that is right there. That's a sheaf. And so they would take it uh, to the temple and they would give it to the priest, and the priest. Yeah, yeah, we go to the foot, you know, football games, right? And what do, the, what do the people do in the state? I don't know if they do it anymore, but they used to do it, right? They would do the what? The wave, right? The wave, all right? So uh, long before they did the wave in the football stadiums, the priest in the Old Testament did the wave. And this was called a wave offering. So he would take that sheaf and he would wave it to the Lord. And... After he waved it to the Lord, then the farmer could go back and partake of the harvest. What a powerful principle. And, and, and so uh, the writer of Proverbs says to honor the Lord with the first fruits. That means give the Lord your first and your best. And if you give the Lord your first and your best, then... Here's the promise. And so, you know, th th this beca really becomes real when we think about it in the agricultural context because notice what he says here. He says, when you give the first fruits to the Lord, when you wave, when you take it to the priest, and the priest does the wave because you've given the first and you've given the best, then God said, when your harvest comes, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And so what is this telling us here? This is telling us that, that giving must be a priority. You've you got to make it a, a priority. It, it can't be. Now, again, we, we're going to talk about uh, how much to give, and you know that, that's a very controversial issue right there. But uh, giving as a Christian, no matter how much it is, it has to be a priority. Because that's, you know, it's almost like cutting off your blessings when you don't make it a priority before the Lord. Yeah, I was uh, reading a story about a, pa a young man who told his pastor that he promised God that he would tithe his income. And they prayed together, and God blessed this young man's career. At the time, he was making $40 an hour, so he gave $4 a week. In a few years, his income increased, increased to $500 a week. And so he called the pastor to see he, if he could be released from his uh, promise to tithe. And the pastor replied, uh, I don't see how you can be released from your promise, but we can ask God to reduce your income to $40 a week. <laughs> So priority, it must be a priority. Secondly, must be a pleasure. Giving must be a pleasure. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. And this whole chapter is talking about giving. 
It says, every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So, we see three things from this verse here. God does not love a sorrowful giver. Now, God, love, God loves everybody, all right? So let me say that. Somebody, I don't anybody walk out here saying, oh, God don't love. No, God loves everybody, all right? But I'm just saying in the context of this passage right here, God does not love a sorrowful giver. He does not love one who feels pressured into giving. So, you know, you go to a lot of churches and the people, the, the, the minister up front is pressuring people, you know, pressuring and people give. And how was that given? That's given because you felt pressure. And if you feel pressure, then you might as well just kept your money in your pocket. Oh, amen. I knew I. <laughs> All right. And God loves a cheerful giver. Let, let, let's look at the notes. Look at your notes. Uh, this verse reveals to us three things about the attitude of the giver. First, it must not be grudgingly. This is from the Greek word lupe, which means, that word grudgingly means sadness, grief, heaviness, or sorrow. Giving should not be out of a heart of regretful bitterness. That if you, if, if people guess, ah, oh, well, you know, man, I, I'm sorry, I gave that. I could have used that for this or that. You know, again, you know, I, I, I'm saying this, you know, and, and as a pastor, and, and many pastors, you know, would not say this, but you probably should have just kept your money in your pocket. Because, you know, it's, it, let's put it this way. It is blessing somebody, but, you, but you're not being blessed. Why? Because your, your attitude and your heart is, is, is not right. You're giving, you know, because of a regretful a, a spirit, a spirit of bitterness, and that's not the way God wants you to give. Second, giving should not be of necessity. The word necessity means being forced or being pressured. It should not, you should not give out of a sense of being forced or pressured. Third, it should be done cheerfully because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Now, I'm sure that y'all probably heard this before. Maybe some of you haven't, but I'm going to say it again. And that is the word cheerful comes from the Greek word hilaros. And guess what English word we get from that? Hilarious. So what is that saying? God loves a hilarious giver. God loves somebody that doesn't give until it hurts. They give until it makes them laugh. Oh! <laughs> God loves a cheerful gift. Now, again, that don't mean you have to laugh and smile when you give, but, you know, what he's looking at, he's, he, he's looking at your heart, right? He's looking at your heart. And so when you give, that you're giving with a cheerful heart. God, thank you that I'm giving to promote the gospel. Lord, I'm giving to meet the needs of the church. Lord, I'm giving to help missionaries around the world. You know, we took up an offering this year uh, for a church in Houston. And, and, you know, as we gave, you know, just to, to see that that church was going in and uh, rehabbing homes. And not only rehabbing homes, but, you know, they were uh, sheltering people who couldn't get into their homes. And they were feeding people who needed to eat. Oh, man, God. Oh, oh man. God, thank you for allowing me to be able to meet that need. God loves a, a cheerful giver. There was a little girl, and her mother was trying to teach her a lesson. And she said that, I'm going to give you a dollar and a quarter, and you decide which one you're going to put in church today. And so after church, the mother asked the daughter, well, which one did you put in? And she said, I put in a quarter. And the mother said, why? And the little girl said, well, I was going to give the dollar, but just before the collection, the man in the pulpit said we should be cheerful givers. 
And I knew I would be more cheerful if I gave the quarter. <laughs> She was telling the truth. She was telling the truth. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. The third thing that I want to say is the place of my giving. Is the place of my giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay, in, uh, lay it by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So as we look at uh, this, you know, we see a couple of things about giving. Uh, the first thing that we see is that they were to give at the place that they gathered. And then the second thing, they were to bring it to the treasury. So you say, well, how, how you get that out of that? All right, let me, let me show you, okay? Uh, in this verse, Paul informs us that about the place we are to give. He said, upon the first day of the week. So, when did the early church gather? When? Which was what? First day of the week. So he said when you gather, right? When you gather, the early church gathered. What does that mean? They came somewhere, right? They didn't stay at home and lay it aside. He said when you gather, when you come together on the first day of the week. So that lets us know they were to give at the place that they gather. And you know, we gather here on Sunday. So to me, the principle that's being taught is that you give where you gather. That you give where uh, you come to worship, where you come to serve, where you come to exercise your gifts. Now, with that said, I, I just want to say, that, and, 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 and I share this by way of example, uh, that I give to several other ministries uh, other than Bethany Baptist Church. I give to Cornerstone Television, you know, on a monthly basis. I give to, uh, there's, there's a Bible program that I watch called Quick Study. I give to them every month. Uh, I, I give to, I'm a, a member of another organization, the Center for Urban Biblical Ministry. I give there. I'm a member of the CCO. I give there. So there are other opportunities that I have to give outside of Bethany Baptist Church. And I, I by all means encourage you that if you have an opportunity, if God grips your heart, like, you know, my heart is really gripped about the word, about Bible study. And so there's a program that comes on every day that takes people through the Bible in a year called Quick Study. And, and that, I'm saying, man, you know, that's, that's where my passion is. That's where my heart is for people to hear and read the word of God and grow. So if there's something outside of Bethany that grips your heart that you feel passionate about, by all means, pray, seek the Lord, how you might be able to be a financial blessing to those other organizations. But the principle I believe that's being taught here is that the place where you gather should be the focal point of your giving. You know, again, you know, they didn't keep it, he didn't say keep it up in your crib. You know, he said bring it when, when you gather. When they gather, they gather on the first day of the week. All right. Secondly, <laughs> this is interesting right here, they were to bring it to the treasury. Notice what Paul says here. He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by, by him in store. All right? So let me go back to my notes here. Uh, the phrase, lay in store, comes from the Greek word theronso, which we get the English word thesaurus. A thesaurus 
is a treasury or a depository for words which are similar. This word was used in Paul's day to refer to treasury or repository. The idea Paul is conveying is to bring the offering to the treasury where they gather. The primary place of one's giving should be where they gather to worship, the treasury. That, you know, remember uh, the disciples? Uh, they uh, had a, a treasury. And who was the treasury? Judas. And he was a thief. And he was taken out of the bag, right? But the disciples had a treasury, all right, that they used to take care of their responsibilities, their needs, and that they also used to meet the needs of others. That Jesus had a treasury. And, and, and so as they gathered in the New Testament, you remember the one time it says that the people sold their property and sold their possessions and that they came and they laid it at the apostles' feet, right? Now, let me say, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble because this broadcast it goes on the radio and it goes on TV too. But let me, sometimes I'll be sitting at home watching preachers and I see people coming up to the front laying money, right? We need to start doing that here at Beckham, right? <laughs> That's what I think. I think we ought to do it. No, just kidding. But they, they come up and they bring money to the front. You know what they call that? Laying money at the apostles' feet. That's, that's where they get that from, from the book of Acts, laying it at the apostles' feet. Now, I, I think that that's going back to what Brother Jeff Taylor said. You know, we want to be hermeneut hermeneutically correct, right? And so from a hermeneutical standpoint, I don't think that, you know, they were saying to bring it up and give it to the preacher, right? But what they were saying is that when they sold, the Bible goes on to say that they sold those things, laid it at the apostles' feet, and what did the apostles do? They distributed it to those who had need. Mm. Mm. So, the apostles had a treasury. There was a treasury that when they brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet, there was a treasury that the apostles then took and dispersed to people who had need. And so the treasury is in the church, that when you bring your resources, your financial resources to the church, you are bringing it to the treasury. And once it comes to the treasury, you know, you, that's, that's why you know, we, last Sunday, for those of you uh, who could stay, uh, Brother Rick stood up here and he went over the budget of the church. He went over the whole budget of the church so that people can see that when you come and you lay your money at the apostles' feet, that you can see where your money is going. That's the treasury. And so when we look at the place of giving, he said upon the first day of the week when they gather together and to lay it up in store, to lay it up in the treasury. All right. So let me move on to my last point. Now, I never sweated so much in preaching a sermon. <laughs> this is this what? How many degrees is it outside? <laughs> All right. All right. Now here goes here, here goes where I'm probably going to uh, lose some people, and here's. <laughs> Here's it, it, probably where I'm going to get some emails, all right? All right. Uh, the percentage of my giving. So notice what he says here uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Uh, he says, uh, as God has prospered you. As God has prospered you. Some say we should tithe which would mean give 10% of your income. Others say that tithing is not found in the New Testament. All right? Which, it, that's true. I mean, you don't, now I know, I, I've listened to all the sermons, and I've heard preachers, you know, that have been hard on tithing, strong on tithing, and they, you know, say tithing is, is found in the New Testament, and, but there's no, no verses in the New Testament 
that talk about tithing. All right? Uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees uh, that you tithe of uh, anise and cumin and those things you should have done. But he was actually, you know, given a reference to those individuals and he wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, commanding that people tithe. But wait on, hold on now, I'm going somewhere uh, before, before you uh, start to stone me or get up and walk out. Uh, all right. Uh, the percentage of giving is a very controversial topic. However, it need not be. It need not be. Simply put, one's giving should be in proportion to their prosperity. If one has prospered much, one should give much, and vice versa. If one has prospered little, one should give little. As we consider some of the Old Testament models, we see Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. That was 10%. That Abraham, this is way before Moses in the law, that Mel, uh, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. I said this on Wednesday. Uh, this is going to blow your mind. You know, a lot of times, you know, we look at the Jewish people in the Old Testament, and, you know, that's where we get the concept of tithing from. But I'll give, I, I give you the verses right here. They're in your notes. Uh, Numbers 18, 21, Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 27, and Deuteronomy 14, 28, that the Israelites gave more than the tithe. They gave every year 23 and a third percent. They gave 10% for the maintenance of the temple and to take care of the Levites. They gave 10%, it was called the feast tithe, where when they you know, had to go to worship the Lord, that they used that tithe to go worship the Lord. And then every three years, they gave a tithe to the poor, which you divided up three years, that's a third, that they, told, they were told to give a tithe to the poor. So that actually means that they gave 23 and a third percent. So if we want to go back and, and, and preach Old Testament tithing, then it's, it's more than 10%. It's 23 and a third percent. All right? Uh, now, let's move into the New Testament. Jesus viewed giving from a percentage. Jesus viewed giving from a percentage. So what am I saying? And I'm going to show you here in a second. Jesus made a comment in reference to giving in which he looked at the people giving and he evaluated their giving based on the percentage. Okay, well now where you get that from? All right, let's go, let's go. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And uh, verse 1. And Jesus, and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Now here we go with that word treasury again, right? Back to that again. So what is the treasury? The treasury is the place where people brought their money, where they gathered, and the leaders uh, received it and then dispersed it. So here we got that word treasury again. Uh, and, and, and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into their treasury. And he saw a certain poor widow casting in there two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Percentage, right? Okay. For all these have of their abundance, percentage, cast in the offerings of God. But she, out of her penury, have cast in all the living that she had. You know how much this lady gave? And it's in your notes. She gave a quarter of a penny. A quarter of a penny. These other guys came in there, and, and, and it says they, they cast, all right? Now, This is Putin, right? When, when they passed the offering today, what did you do? You put 
you put. These guys didn't put. It says they cast, that they, they cast their money into the treasury, right? And, and here comes this widow, you know, creeping in, and she takes out a quarter of a penny, and she puts it in. And Jesus said that she has put in, percentage-wise, more than they put in. Because she gave out of all that she had. And these guys just gave off the top. You know, they, they, you know, their giving was not proportionate to what they had been blessed with. And so God says, Jesus, now isn't, isn't it interesting, of all the things that Jesus could have done and Jesus commented on, that he's standing at the temple looking <laughs> at how much people gave. You know, all, I mean, man, Jesus, you should have been trying to lead somebody to yourself. You should have been trying to help folk. You, 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 you should have been trying to heal somebody. Here you are standing looking at what people put in the offering. How dare you? But that's what he was doing. That's what the text says. That's what he was doing. And after he did it, he made an observation about the fat cats that put in all this cash. And yet still, he said it didn't scratch the surface on what they could have did. And this one little lady came and she gave of all that she had. The last verse that I want to share before I call my body guard, no, but before I call the, the, the musicians back. Luke 6, Luke 6. Verse 38. Again, Jesus is talking, he just got finished talking about forgiveness, that you should grant forgiveness if you want to be forgiven. He just got finished talking about that. In verse 38, he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And so as we look at this here, uh, Jesus, because somebody will look at this and say, well, it just says to give. You know, and, and so, you know, some people try to get, get out of giving a certain amount, give out of a certain percentage. But Jesus says here, give. And the giving that takes place here is, to me, as you read this verse, is an abundant giving. Because this is what I put in the notes. Uh, also, in Luke 6.38, Jesus commands believers to give. The given spoken of here is not to see how little one can get away with giving or for the one who does not believe in tithing to skimp as much as possible in giving. But the giving here is a lavish one. It comes out of a heart that wants to receive all the blessings the Lord has to offer. So somebody said, well, you still didn't answer the question. What is a percentage? See me after church and I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm going to let the Holy Spirit deal with you. You know, I mean, this morning, you are the jury, right? You are the jury. I presented the case. If the evidence is strong, then you'll make the decision. If the evidence is weak, then you'll make the decision. If the Spirit is ministering to you, you want to make the decision. So I've presented the evidence. You make the decision. Father, we come to you this morning.
And Lord, as we have come today, Lord, we've talked about the priority of giving. We've talked about the pleasure of giving. We've talked about the place of giving. And we've talked about the percentage of giving. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that you would guide and direct us. Because, Father, it makes no difference what Pastor Glaze believes, but it makes all the difference in the world what the Word of God says. And so, Lord, help us to give in a way that you are pleased. Help us to give in a way where it's not a reflection of a heart of selfishness. It's not a heart of greed, but it's a heart of one that loves God and is so deeply appreciative of the great salvation that they have in Jesus Christ that one gives. Again, not to a man, not to the pastor, not to the deacons, but Lord, unto the Lord, unto you. And as it's given unto you, Lord, we pray that you would help us to realize that those who receive it have to be responsible and make sure that what they're giving is going to enhance the gospel and to further the kingdom. And so we thank you, Lord, that you call us partners in this great work to be able to have a part of serving you through our giving. But Lord, all of that means nothing without a relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if, if, if you are here today and you're not saved, then I would recommend you keep your money in your pocket. Because you are a guest. But those of us who know the Lord and know what he means to us, we give out of that passion. And the greatest thing that you could give to Jesus Christ if you don't know him is not your money, is not your resources, but the greatest thing that you can give is your heart. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray today that you might come and that you might offer your heart to him and say, Lord, I give my life to you. What must I do to be saved? We have people here that can open up the word of God and show you how to become a child of God. And so, Father, we pray that you would have your way during this invitation today. For it's in Christ's name. Amen. Let us stand. Just as I...